this morning, and you'll find that in <coughs> the book of James, James chapter 1, which is on page 1213 in our Red Church Bibles. Page 1213. And we're just going to read the opening four verses. <coughs> James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance and perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete not lacking anything Amen well, You will have uh, gathered I imagine from the reading we had just now that what I'd like to do this morning is to return to our studies uh, in the book of James and since it's been a little while since we were last there I would like to crave your indulgence in order that I might once again just set out the background to this letter so that we can get a feel for what's going on within this letter and, and understand the reasoning behind James's very direct approach to these Jewish believers so first of all uh, we remind ourselves of who James himself was. Uh, his name appears in that opening phrase, James. Now there are several Jameses in the New Testament. Um, it's believed uh, that the James who wrote this was in fact the half-brother of Jesus, um, who prior to his own conversion had been very skeptical of Jesus' claims. However, he was converted, it seems, as the result of one of Jesus' resurrection appearances. Uh, and, I, oh, you haven't got a memory stick. <laughs> Excuse me whilst I give him a memory stick so he can throw up all the verses on the phrase as I mention them. He was sitting there looking so innocent and now I know why. Um, anyway, the first reference is uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 7. We can use the old manual approach and look it up in the Bible. It's... Uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 7 where Paul has been listing the uh, resurrection appearances of Jesus uh, and in verse 7 he refers to the fact then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles and it is assumed that this uh, is the James that we have here James the half brother of Jesus and if you look uh, as you read on say from the book of uh, Paul's letter to the Galatians and elsewhere uh, in the book of Acts you can see how that James actually went on to become one of the key figures in the church at Jerusalem uh, and of course the church there had been brought into being through the outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost and the event of Pentecost actually witnessed the conversion of thousands of Jews who embraced the message that this Jesus who had been crucified was indeed the Christ and that was a message that they would then in turn have carried home with them as they returned to their own towns and cities in Judea or further afield to the many Jewish communities that were scattered across the whole Mediterranean region to the west or to the east into the vast regions of the Parthian Empire the Jews as they returned home from these great feasts like Pentecost took with them the message that this Jesus was the Christ. Now that of course means that in the early formative moments of the church uh, this new kind of messianic movement that, that grew up uh, it means that of course it would have been comprised almost entirely of Jews and the reason for that being that, 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 that at that early point um, the Jews had not yet appreciated that the Gentiles were to be included in. They still thought as that the Gentiles were beyond the pale of redemption and it did take a little while for the penny to drop that God intended the news of Jesus the Christ to be shared with the Gentiles as well that they too might be brought in to the people of God and the kind of slowness of that process 
is illustrated in the story of the conversion of Cornelius uh, in Acts chapter 10 and 11. Now Cornelius was a Gentile, but he was what is referred to as a Gentile God-fearer, um, a term that was used to describe those Gentiles who had become adherents of the Jewish religion. And in Acts 10 and 11, we see how that God challenged Peter to take the word to this Gentile. Peter had his prejudices. He thought, no, God, I, I, Gentiles are unclean. We don't share the good news with them. God had to confront Peter about his prejudices and show him that, God, that he, God, was going to bring the Gentiles in that they too might be saved. And the story of the conversion of Cornelius ends with this light bulb moment in Acts 11 and verse 18 where Peter has had to defend and explain why it was he took the message to Cornelius and how it was that God saved him and poured out his spirit upon this man. So clearly it was all part and parcel of what God was doing. And then we read there that when they who had objected to um, Peter's actions, when they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God saying, so then, God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto faith. This is a light bulb moment for these Jews. Whoa, the Gentiles are going to be in on this one as well. And so slowly the door began to open, the word began to go out, and in due course, Gentiles were included in. Now, my understanding of the setting of James's letter is that it belongs to this pre-Gentile period when the church is by and large almost entirely Jewish and Jerusalem is still very much at the center of all that is going on and it's there in Jerusalem as Paul in the letter to the Galatians tells us that you'll find people like James and Peter and John the pillars of the church and no doubt other of the apostles as well and there in Jerusalem, they would have concentrated um, all their work, all their activity in providing pastoral support <coughs> for the local Jews who had put their faith in Jesus as the Christ, as well as those Jews who were coming in from afar. Those perhaps who had been converted at Pentecost, taken the seed back to their own communities, sown it, others had been converted. They were now returning to Jerusalem still to celebrate the great Jewish festivals. And James was there, right at the hub of this wheel. As a key leading figure in the church, he was there, teaching and counselling, comforting and encouraging, challenging and rebuking, shepherding the believers in their new found faith. And for those early believers, for that opening period of time, it must have seemed as if they were riding on the crest of a wave. As a community of people, they were clearly owned of God. They enjoyed both his presence and his power. And sometimes there were spectacular consequences of that. They saw God moving in miraculous and mighty ways amongst them. And it would wow the crowds who witnessed what God was doing through these people who held up Jesus as being the Christ. And yet whilst there was perhaps popular support for the new movement, it's also clear from what Luke has to tell us in the book of Acts that not everybody was convinced about the legitimacy of this new movement. And as you turn the pages of the book of Acts, it becomes increasingly clear that the levels of opposition to this new movement began to mount, and particularly in the case of Orthodox Judaism. They really took exception to this promotion of Jesus as the Christ. They openly resisted it and ridiculed their, this, this belief. Because to them, the whole idea of a crucified Christ was nothing less than something blasphemous. It was a complete nonsense that needed stamping out. And this opposition, as you read the opening chapters of Acts, this oppo opposition begins to build, the pressure begins to build. And it comes to a head when one of the church's leading figures, a man by the name of Stephen, was sentenced to death by the Sanhedrin, which we may liken in some ways to Israel's highest court. And he was stoned to death for his beliefs. That event then triggered an all-out assault 
on the believers in the church in Jerusalem. And Luke records that fact in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1 where we read following the death of Stephen that on that day a great persecution broke out amongst, against the church at Jerusalem and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul, who later became Paul, the apostle Paul, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. And then to act, we may add the next one, Acts 11 and verse 19, where just the reference there that those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, telling the message, but only to Jews. But the church in Jerusalem is scattered. The idea, as I say, was originally to stamp it out, to get rid of it. But of course, in seeking to stamp out the fire that was beginning to burn, they just sent up a whole shower of sparks that spread right across the region. And the word just went out even further. More and more were converted. And so what seemed like a very negative event, you're thinking, you know, surely what we want is strong growth in Jerusalem, the center. Instead of that, you might be thinking, you know, that, that, that's what everybody's looking for. But God had other ideas. And the persecution that broke out is under his control. Because what it does is it spreads the word even further. More and more are saved as a result of the persecution. If there had been no persecution, it might have been a very slow burner. But the persecution sparks off a lot of growth. But what we read there from Acts, and what Luke has to tell us, is that just a few of the apostles stayed on in Jerusalem, one of whom is James. His congregation, now all gone, scattered, turfed out of Jerusalem, scattered far and wide. And for that congregation, for those, I don't know how many there were, many, for those many people, the cost of their commitment to Jesus as the Christ suddenly became startlingly clear because now for his sake they'd lost everything their homes their businesses their livelihoods family friends the whole community is torn apart by this sudden outbreak of violent persecution suddenly Jerusalem city of God was a dangerous place to be as the mobs roam the streets looking for believers that they might take hold of, that they might imprison, that they might victimize. Betrayal was in the air. Who could you trust? Who would turn you in now to the authorities? Suddenly for this people of God, things changed. And so it was that in a matter of just a few days, everything changed as they were driven from the city. And it must have been a terrible time. Uh, not unlike that experience, I think, that's captured by the author of Hebrews. And Hebrews is another letter written to Jewish believers who are being persecuted for their faith and who are struggling with what is happening to them. But as the author to the Hebrews points out initially, he says, have I got Hebrews? I don't think I have, have I? No, no, okay. Uh, Hebrews uh, 10 we are. He, to quote it, he says, you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. Some of you were imprisoned. Others of you had your property confiscated. And the author of Hebrews reminds his readers how that at that point they had stood firm in the face of the fires of persecution. And the reason why they stood firm was because they knew that they themselves had better and lasting possessions. They had Jesus and the glory to come. And that was enough ballast to put in the bottom of the boat to, to keep them sailing on through this storm. And yet, having said that, it's also clear that afterwards, after the initial onslaught against them that they'd stood against, afterwards the full impact of the traumatic times through which they'd passed began to take its toll. In Hebrews, the book, makes it quite plain that the faith of many at that time faltered. Their confidence collapsed. Hence the need for the letter to be written to them. 
written to encourage and to restore. And I think that's precisely what's happened here to James's far-flung flock. Initially, they too are in a state of shock. But that shock then in turn morphs into a state of confusion, and that in turn is accompanied by a collapse in their confidence in God. And that's what you find as you work through James's letter. What James is seeking to do is to recover these people who have, whose hands, as it were, have, have, have been loosened and they no longer have a firm grip on what they believed and the one in whom they trusted. People who are struggling against what has been going on. And if you can imagine them for a moment, okay, you've been thrown out of Jerusalem. Here you were thinking, you were the, you were the new people. And you've been thrown out of Jer- Jerusalem. And you must be beginning to think, well, surely if Jesus was the Christ, if Jesus was the pinnacle of God's purposes, and if they were his pucker people, how could it have all gone so wrong? Had they got it wrong themselves? Had they misread the signs? Had they backed the wrong horse? And so it is that for these believers to whom James is writing, the doubts that they were having were beginning to seep in and they were giving rise to a crisis of confidence and a crisis of identity. Had they made a mistake? Had they got it wrong? Is that why this awful thing had happened to them? And so we have these people scattered. And I don't know quite how long the period was between their expulsion from Jerusalem and James's catching up with them with this letter. Clearly it was long enough for these people to kind of resettle and to establish a new community. Quite how far they've gone, uh, we do not know. But they've settled, they've formed a new community. The trouble is that the new community is not a happy place. As you read through James's letter, you find out that there are a lot of people falling out with each other. There are a lot of arguments, there's division within the community of God's people. Things are not looking good. And it would seem that somebody must have brought James a, a report on what was happening, on what was going wrong amongst his former congregation. And in response to that, in response to that, he writes this letter, the letter of James. No nonsense, no punches pulled, recovery plan. Packed with counsel and advice and exhortation, with the sole aim in mind of reviving their faith and restoring their confidence and reaffirming their beliefs once again. So in this letter, James is really on a mission. And it's just packed with practical help and advice. Now I suppose if he wanted, he could have just sent them a brief note, couldn't he? Dear friends, I am praying for you all. Love, James. And you can imagine them receiving that note from James here. He's praying for us. Fantastic. And everything would have just carried on as before. But clearly James didn't think that praying for them was enough. No doubt he prayed for them every day, but he knew that that was not enough. He knew that what they needed was a robust, rollicking, a no-nonsense dressing down in order that he might build them up. And whilst James's bedside manner might not have been fully appreciated, James knew that these believers needed a serious talk because much of their practice, their Christian practice, was in need of reformation. Quite often, you know, we do say, I'll pray for you. When perhaps more is actually needed. Sometimes prayer is not enough. We need to be there supporting, encouraging, challenging, rebuking, building up. James saw the need for practical action as well. Prayer was not enough. And it's really in these opening verses, those first four verses that we read, that James sets out his stall and sets the tone for the rest of the letter. Everything is set out in the opening four verses. And just what I want to do this morning is just briefly run through those verses because they just set it up for all that follows. And so in James chapter 1 and verse 1, James has that opening sentence. He refers to himself, this is from me, from James, And he refers to himself as servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
In spite of the calamity that had overtaken the community in Jerusalem, James is still proud to nail his colors to Jesus' mast. As far as James is concerned, Jesus is still the Christ, irrespective of what seemed to have gone terribly wrong, irrespective of the problems in Jerusalem. James is happy to be a servant of God and a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so James at the outset makes it clear that he is still investing heavily in Jesus, even if the market price had fallen. And the reason why he's investing is because he's convinced that his investment in Jesus will make a great return. And he, for one, is not going to sell his shares. He's sticking with Jesus. And that's where he starts, making it clear to those he's writing to, Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is Lord. He is God's Son. I know it may seem different to that. I know the problems may have overrun you completely. But let's start off again, reasserting the key facts. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The Lord Jesus Christ. And then James goes on to bolster their own belief in who they are. They crisis in their own sense of identity. Who are we? Are, 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 are we really the people of God? And what James is saying to you, to them is, yes, you are. Irrespective of the fact that most people are dismissing you as totally irrelevant. You are the people of God. In spite of your enforced exile, as followers of Jesus, you are the pucker people of God. And to emphasize that fact, James addresses them as being the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. To them he sends his greetings, literally the 12 tribes of the diaspora. Now, once again, this is an immensely significant statement. I know for us we can just be past it before we know we've even read it. But it's an immensely significant statement for two reasons. First of all, James' description of them as being part of the 12 tribes. That deliberately flags up, uh, flags them up as being a part of the Paka people of God. The Twelve tribes were just an embracive term for the people of God. Um, but it was a term that was acknowledged as summing up who you were, what your identity was. And James is saying to them, these, these poor people scattered far and wide, he says, you are the twelve tribes. You, you are the twelve tribes. The Paka people of God. And in addition to that, he describes them as being part of the diaspora, those scattered among the nations. Now, the term diaspora was a term that was widely used in the Jewish community to describe those ethnic Jews or Israelites who had been scattered throughout the Middle East because of earlier times of exile, whether it's Babylonians or the Assyrians or whatever. The communities had been spread far and wide. And those Jews who lived scattered across the Mediterranean, scattered across the Parthian Empire, they were known as the Diaspora. And James now speaks to these scattered few. He says, you are the twelve tribes. You are the Diaspora. He wants to give them a sense of their identity. And he bestows upon them these important titles or, or terms. They are the true manifestation of God's people. Irrespective of what it may look like, irrespective of what they may feel like, this is who you are. Twelve tribes scattered. So be encouraged, he's saying to them. Don't let people take away your true identity of who you have become in Christ. You are the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. He then moves on immediately to pinpoint the root cause of the problems that were besetting this community. Now once again, think about the community, the state they are in. There is, they are feeling bruised and battered by the storms of life. They're struggling to hold their own. They're probably somewhat disenchanted with the way things have gone. They've, they've certainly gone off the boil. You read that as you go through the letter and James is trying to restore their faith and confidence in God. These are people who have gone off the boil because of what has happened to them. So what does James say to these people? He says, Let them consider it pure joy, 
my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, pure joy, my brothers. That terrible time you're passing through, that you're still experiencing the, the repercussions of, consider it pure joy. Because those trials, those seemingly terrible times, they are good for you. And he says to them, that's no surprise, is it? He says, you know that is actually the case because he says, you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. It was how they responded to the trial through which they were passing and still experiencing. It was how they were responding to that which was the key to their problems. The problem was they were not responding to it positively but negatively. And this verse here is key. It comes right at the beginning of his letter. He's flagging it up saying this sets the tone for all that follows. This, this is what this is all about. This is what I want you to do. Get home, drive it home into your heart and understanding. You need to consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. Many kinds. It doesn't, doesn't matter what comes rolling into your life like a steamroller, like a tsunami. These trials, he says, have a purpose in God's hands. And that is the strengthening of your faith. And I say this is a crucial key lesson in the Christian life which we must learn. We must learn to consider it pure joy whenever we face trials of many kinds. Because if we don't, the consequences can seriously blight our Christian lives. As evidenced, illustrated by this community that Paul, that James is writing to. Their whole life, their whole spiritual life <coughs> is being blighted by their failure to appreciate and benefit from the trial through which they are passing. Like them, we too need to learn the lesson and be utterly convinced of the fact that in God's hands, a negative experience can have a positive outcome for our faith. Now, I appreciate that what James is saying here is the very opposite of how we would normally react. You're thinking, you must be joking. Pure joy, not just joy, pure joy, he says. When I'm suffering, going through different times and, and suffering, and when all the wheels are coming off, you're saying consider it pure joy? Yes, says James, I'm saying consider it pure joy. So that you can look to God, trust in God, and have your faith strengthened. If we fail to see the, our trials, and all of us pass through trials, various degrees, but if we fail to see those trials in a positive light, then there is a very real risk that we'll probably end up blaming God for what's going on. We will look at him and ask him, what on earth does he think he is doing in our lives? And the problem with that is that if that problem takes root in our hearts, then it can result in our becoming embittered with God, or frustrated with God, or angry with God, or disenchanted with God. Because he is not doing what we expect him to do. He's not there for us as we had hoped and expected. And as I say, this is the problem that overtook the community that James writes to. They have become disenchanted. I think they have become uh, embittered. And the problem with that is it lifts the latch for three enemies to come in. And, and these are the enemies that James deals with in the rest of the letter. And those three enemies are the world, the flesh, and the devil. You lift the latch, and they come in, and they will camp. They will take advantage of our doubt in God. The calling challenge here is to, despite the pain, despite the personal suffering and anguish through which one might be passing, the call is to have faith in God and trust him. And to draw from him the help and grace you need to cope with a time of of trouble. Uh, Peter draws, uh, ma makes a similar point. Uh, 1 Peter 1 and verse, verses 6 and 7. Peter's been talking about their 
the faith of those to whom he wrote, talking about their hope, and he says, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. But these have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Once again, the principle is the same. The hard times, the difficult moments, the times when tears are streaming down your face, those are the times you hang on to God and you continue to trust him and you do not question him. But you seek to rely upon who he is and his love for you. I suppose when you run into a trial, the question is always, can God be trusted in this? Can I trust God to bring me through? We need to ask him to help us to handle and cope with our own own emotions and inner thoughts and with our flesh and our desires that will rise up given the opportunity against God and put big question marks over who he is and what on earth he thinks he's doing in our lives. James, as does Peter really, that's at the beginning of his letter, James opens up with this, this theme of trusting God. If you trust God, then everything else will follow in its place. It doesn't make it smooth, but it just says that everything will follow in its place. And here in James, what James is having to do is to unpick everything that had gone so wrong in the community. But the thing that had gone wrong was their failure to trust God. They'd been worn down, worn out, and they gave up. James seeks to refire their faith in God. And so next week, God willing, um, as we return to chapter 4, which is where we got to, uh, we will pick up, with that background, we will pick up what's going on in this community. How is God seeking to restore the faith of these people? Well, let's pray. Father, we are very mindful that in life there are times when the going can be very hard. When things get tough. When, Lord, there is that danger of the question arising in our hearts. That doubt that's aimed at you. That questioning of who you are and what you're doing. Lord, help us to trust. Help us, Lord, to just look to you to help us through these trials of life that will come upon us so that our faith may be strengthened, that we might be matured and complete, not lacking anything, but faithfully persevering on. Help us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.